Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And um, we're going to start moving uh, through the rest of Daniel chapter 11, uh, slowly, carefully. But before we do that, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for the time that we have once again uh, to open your word together to receive the bread of life, to receive nourishment uh, for our spiritual health and for the strength for today. I pray that you can be with each person studying these things and that you can continue to help and guide us as we um, continue in Daniel chapter 11. We're thankful for the things that we've learned the past couple of weeks and the way that you have pulled all of this information uh, together to make sense. I just pray that others who are studying can take the time uh, to look at the evidence that has been presented and that they can uh, come to the same conclusion if it is correct and if it is not, that they can show us information that can correct uh, what it is we've done. Be with us now in this study through thy spirit. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. And um, of course, yesterday we finished off Revelation 17. So, um, you know, and I suggest people who are watching this video go back and look over the last couple of studies at least um, to see why we drew the conclusion that we did that this in the seven kings, the sixth king, the one that is, is Biden. And um, Angela had sent me an email regarding January 21st. Um, so that date, which we have actually for the scale of the School of the Prophets, Ellen White mentions that date in connection with uh, the Reign of Terror. That's going to be on January 21st, 1793. So that's 386 years before uh, Biden uh, has his first full day in office. Um, so the significance there is that that's also an anniversary date. It's 258 years from the very day that that fully committed France to the persecution of the reformers. So if you go from 1793 back to um, uh, um back 258 years, that's going to bring you to what year? 1798 minus 258. It's going to be 1538, I believe. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So 250 years before 1798? 1793. 1793. Yeah. So it's January 21st, 1793. So you would take off. Uh, so you uh, would. No, it's, it'd be uh, 15, 15, uh, 40. No, 15, 15, 43, wouldn't it? Uh, no, because you got to take off eight. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so it'd be. <laughs> I don't know why I'm having so much trouble but subtracting uh, 258 from 1793. But if you take off, oh, I see what I did wrong. Yeah, so it would be um, uh, 1535. There's the date. Now, we can see 1535 uh, relates to the symbol of the 1533 and the three, thir uh, 1335, right? It, it, kinda, it has the same... Uh, digits, right? Different amounts of fives and threes, but uh, kind of interesting there because we have that 1,533. So we got 1,535 uh, uh, as in January 21st. So that's when France, the day that France is fully committed to the persecution of the reformers. So this time it's going to be instead of what was happening with the reformers? This is going to be Louis, uh, Louis, Louis the Sixteenth, King of France, 
who's going to be dragged through and have his head cut off. Right. So, <clears throat> um, so it's kind of interesting, you know, that January 21st date. So, so Angela noticed that. Um, so that's, that's in page Ellen White's quoting, um, uh, Wiley and, and that's going to be on page 230 of the Great Controversy, if somebody wants to look that up. Okay, so um, so that's what we, we had done yesterday. We had, we had finished off that study. Now, the point that, that I made at the end of the study yesterday is that I believe that if we go through Daniel chapter 11, as we did with the book of Judges, that we should see the history of this movement. That is, we know that the history of this movement is about Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. And that when we go back and we look at the beginning of Daniel chapter 11, we have a parallel by a repeat of history of the kings of Persia as the presidents of the United States. Now, where Colin in his study on December 25th, 2021, made uh, a comparison between uh, Trump and Alexander. That is, he said, Alexander is a type of Trump. That is, he's typifying Trump, um, which didn't really make sense based upon how we would study um, repeats of history. That is, we would look at the application and we would just see that how that history unfolded and compare it to the present. And since these are two different kingdoms, you have Persia, which represents the United States, and Greece, which represents the globalists, and Trump, who is opposed to the globalists, he couldn't be Alexander. Now, we do know that, that Xerxes, who is uh, typifying Trump, does oppose Greece. He stirs up all against the realm of Greece, and he loses to Greece. And that's why in verse 3, we see Alexander as the next player because this is the next kingdom. Right? So these are the kingdoms of Bible prophecy, Medo-Persia followed by Greece. And um, now we, we noticed that this, according to his will, that this is a characteristic that typifies the papacy. Now here, of course, it's being applied to Alexander. He's, he's not the Pope. But this, this thread applies to each of the kingdom, each of the kingdoms. So we see this characteristic in Persia. We see this characteristic in Greece. And we see this characteristic in Rome. And we see it in the papal power itself. So this, this, this characteristic doing according to his will um, relates to the laws, right? That's why we have it in Persia, because in Persia, they have the law of the Medes and the Persians. But we see this thread being carried through each of the kingdoms. So in some ways, Alexander typifies uh, the papacy, right? Because of this characteristic. Okay, now in Daniel 11, verse 4, it says, when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled for the kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides beside those. Now, this dividing to the four winds of heaven, generally speaking, when you, you go to an evangelist event, uh, evangelistic series and, and the Adventist evangelistic, evangelistic series, they're going to talk about how Greece is divided into four kingdoms and then, you know, then into two and then ultimately uh, uh, the Seleucid kingdom wins over, right? So um, now, of course, this doesn't say it divides into four kingdoms. It divides to the four winds of heaven. And this brings us back to Daniel chapter 8, um, where we have this uh, described as well. 
toward the four winds of heaven. So that's following Miller's rules. You compare the four winds of heaven. Now, we also know that there's all of these winds that are relating to destruction, right? So there's the holding back of the four winds. Now, so when it talks about the four winds here, I mean, this idea is, is a, we all believe there's north, south, east, and west, right? So the winds come from these directions. So, of course, you can get a north, north, west, and, or I guess a, and yeah, I guess north, northwest. You can mix them up a little bit. I mean, you can't get an east west wind, but you know, you can get a wind that's coming from the northwest or the northwest, west northwest, I think is how they say it. If it's more west, but a little bit north, I don't know. I can't remember how that system works. Um, but this idea of the four winds of heaven just means that this kingdom is divided in all those different directions. It doesn't necessarily have to be divided into four different kingdoms. Now, we're going to just look at a map of this. And there's lots of different maps, you know, because at different times, uh, you know, Greece is divided up differently. But this one is at the death of Alexander the Great, about 300 BC. It says here, circa 301 BC. E. Um, now, so Alexander's kingdom had covered all of this, but now you're going to see that um, uh, when he dies, some of that kingdom is going to be just lost. So way off to the right, you see in India there, um, that uh, in 305, Seleucus ceded the province of Maria for 500 war elephants. So he's going to give up some of that kingdom. So the kingdom's slowly going to shrink a little bit. Um, but you can see Seleucus the first, Nicator, he's going to um, have that part that we would really call the main Persian empire that, that was conquered by Alexander. So it's going to mostly be uh, Persia that he, that he gets. Now you're going to see that he's not going to have the Levant. That's going to be an, Tigonus the first. He's going to have uh, the parts of the place that we would have as um, uh, well. I guess there you're going to have like parts of of Turkey and different things like that. Um, Armenia, right? So then, uh, so that area there that's the Levant, that's going to be his as well. So he's going to have the Isle of Crete and things, other places. And then Ptolemy is going to get northern um, northern Africa, or really just Egypt and um, Alexandria, Memphis, Thebes, all that area, area there, north of Libya, Libyan desert. And then you're going to see Cassander and Lysimachus. They're going to have um, that area over there where you've got... Um, uh, you know, Greece and um, just trying to think of all the names of these, well, obviously Athens and so forth. So they're going to have the area that we would call the Greek, uh, the area of Greece, right? Now, now, if that's the case, you can see that the divisions are five, Lysimachus, Cassander. Now, often you'll get the list as Lysimachus, Cassander, Seleucus, and Ptolemy, because Seleucus is going to conquer Antigonus, right? That's my understanding. So, so it is going to devolve into four. And, and some other people even have further divisions. Um, like, I think I've seen up to like seven divisions immediately after Alexander's death. But, but here we have five. It's going to, but it's going to end up being two, right? The king of the north is going to be Seleucus, and Ptolemy is going to be the king of the south, right? So, and any questions about this? Do we, we, do we believe it has to be the four winds refer to the four, um, that four divisions, or do the four winds just refer to the four directions of the compass?
So nobody has any problem with that? That seems fine. Okay. So because when you get to Daniel 8.8, 8, therefore the he goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken, right? So um, we know that this goat has a notable horn between his eyes, right? That this is this single horn of a goat, which goats normally have two horns. But this is Alexander. And this this horn is going to be broken. And it says, uh, for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. Now, we know that that there are going to be four notable ones, right? So even though it's it's divided into more uh, more than four, there's four notable ones. Now this word um, notable is a weird word. It means a look, hence figuratively striking appearance. Uh, notable one vision. It's translated as sometimes. Um, and so how do we understand this? So we have the four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And it says out of one of them came forth a little horn. We know out of one of them is not out of one of the horns, but out of one of the directions of the compass. So out of one of those directions, because the one that's going to come out is Rome. Is Rome part of the Greek empire? No, no. So it's not part of the Greek empire. And so what some commentators do is they say, well, this is going to come out of one of the horns, one of these notable ones. Right. And so then they're going to say, well, that's going to be Antiochus Epiphanes. Right. He's going to come out of one of those horns. But. It doesn't say it comes out of one of the horns. It says it comes out of one of the winds, right? Because of the, the nature of the, the gender here. Um, when we look at uh, these here, Karen is a horn. Just hang on a second here. I'm going to go to the Hebrew. We can look at that. Um, so I know you can't read Hebrew, but I can look at the gender more easily. Um, 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 okay. Yeah, so what you're going to have is uh, this feminine form. Uh, so you're going to have not masculine forms here. Um, and uh, um, so you're going to have this one is, is in the feminine form and uh, and it's the horn of littleness. It's going to be feminine as well and it's going to match up with the winds um yeah it's kind of hard to clearly see here um but uh oh, there it is so the horns the horns are masculine but this little horn is not and and the winds are feminine so i'm just trying to find here um Yeah, so there we have the winds. You can see it's it's got a, a, a tav at the end, and that's going to be uh, the feminine form. It's actually ot. It's a vav and the tav at the end. It's got ruach. That's a resh, a vav, and ha. So then ruach, ot. 
So it's feminine. So you can see that the winds are feminine. And the little horn is feminine. So it comes out of there. But the other horns are masculine. So, um, so you can see here, this here, Karen, and it's got a fat masculine form. It's not a feminine form. Okay. <clears throat> so hopefully that helps a little bit. This is something we should all know, of course, that, that when you have on, um, the, on some of the 1843 charts, it has a head, a goat's head with four horns and a, and a little horn coming out of one of the four horns. That's not original to the 1843 chart. Rich, he put, when he made his uh, revision of the 1843 chart, and he put the stone in there, and he put the goat's head in there, uh, which is misplaced, was added to the chart. It wasn't removed from the chart. Um, he believed that that was original to the chart. And so uh, him and I had a disagreement about that. Um, but you'll see that some people use that chart of Rich's. That's the one with the goat's head that's got all the, the it's been retypeset. So we took the images, put them again on a, on a background and added the text so that you could read it more easily. Um, but it has that goat's head with uh, the horn coming out of one of the horns. And uh, that would be incorrect. Okay. So when we go to Daniel chapter 11, and we're going to see that his kingdom's divided to the four winds of heaven. Here, it's not going to talk about the different uh, kingdoms, right? Now, it says here, uh, nor, for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. What does that mean? His kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. I mean, we just sometimes read these sentences. We don't think about what they mean. Because his kingdom is divided towards the four wind of heaven. It doesn't go to his posterity, right? Nor according to the dominion which he ruled. So that means it's not going to be the entire kingdom that he had, right? For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. What does that sentence mean, that last part? His kingdom shall be plucked up, even for others besides those. Just, what does it mean? So it's kind of an obscure way that the sentence is written. Because King James is kind of a literal translation. It doesn't always make sense. I'm just going to look at some other translations here. So it says here, for his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others besides these. These what? These, his posterity, according to his authority which he, with which he ruled. What? Bishops, Bibles, pretty the, the four winds, those, those who were ruling, those four winds, no, the four, four areas that were taken over by those who succeed, who, who, who did succeed uh, Alexander the Great. That's what I'm thinking. I'm also thinking when he says plucked up, I, I think, I think of the papacy. Plucking yeah, up so kingdom. I think it ultimately refers to uh, the papacy. Um, or to Rome, at least, that it's 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 stretching out into the future. Because they translate it, they're trying to make it like it's saying, and I, I could be wrong, but they're trying to make it saying, well, um, it goes towards the uh, four winds of heaven. It's going to be plucked up. Um, but it says even for others besides those. And the question is, what is those qualifying? Um, no, so it could say besides these, right? Because in Hebrew, these and those, there is no these and those like we have in English. Um, 
but it's not to his posterity according to the dominion which is ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. So, um, so the we know that the kingdom's ultimately going to be conquered by Rome, and and I think that's an allusion to the end of his kingdom. But then it's going to talk about how this kingdom is divided, and it's going to just focus upon two divisions of it: the king of the south and the king of the north, right? So however we understand that verse, we know that even though there's, it's divided towards the four winds of heaven. And, and Daniel 8 says that there are four notable kings, right? There's going to be four notable divisions or horns, right, that are going to be there. The four horns are not the four winds. But it's divided to the four winds, and there's going to be four notable horns. But then, really, the focus here in Daniel 11 is going to be on the king of the north and the king of the south. And it's going to be, ultimately, the king of the north is going to become Rome. Rome is going to take over that area of, of um, Alexander's kingdom uh, that is the Seleucid part of it. And then it's going to conquer the Ptolemaic Empire as well, right? Though even the Ptolemaic Empire is kind of already gone by the time Rome steps in. It depends when you look at how Rome is stepping in, right? But ultimately, Rome is going to rule that empire. Like it's going to take over Alexander's empire, plus much more. His empire is not going to go all the way to India, like take parts of India, but... But still, the Roman Empire is going to be the bigger empire. It's going to be plucked up. Or, or pardon, Alexander's empire is going to be plucked up ultimately by Rome. Okay, so, so now it gets into the king of the south shall be strong in one of his princes. Now, we've gone through this before. and um, But what we're looking for is something that we weren't looking for in the past that is we're looking for symbols that we hadn't we hadn't thought of looking for right so we have what kind of things do we have as symbols that we need to take note of If we're going to be doing it like we were in the book of Judges, what kind of what kind of details should we pay attention to? We, we don't have names of people here, right? So we can't look at, you know, Alexander's, you know, Hebrew name or the number for it, right? The Strong's numbers. But we can look at, at the meanings of words. Their definitions, what they what they mean as far as as symbols. We can also look at the numbers of those definitions, right? So they're they're going to have some kind of symbolism in them. What else? What else are we going to be looking at? What did we look at in Judges? Because we need to mark events, right? And what are, what are we going to do with these events? How are we going to address these events? You guys need to talk more. Instead of me answering the questions. Well, I know in Judges 2, we had each verse that would be a year in, in the present truth movement. Now I'm thinking since there are 45 verses in Daniel 11, could each verse represent a president of the U.S.? Maybe that's really far out, but. Okay. Well, yeah. So we, we've already established the idea that the 45th verse has reference to the 45th president. Right. So. And, and, and basically the 40 to 45 represents well, we had it as sort of 
you know, we'd probably have to go from 41 to 45 if we're going to have Trump as the fifth. Um, but we definitely didn't have him as the sixth. But we looked at the presidents of the United States. So if we take verse 40, that's the time of the end, right? So we can do it with the last part, at least. So if we, we look at the time of the end, we got um, uh, Reagan and Bush. So that's 40 and 41, right? 42 is going to be Clinton. 43, Bush uh, the second. 44, Obama. And 45 being Trump, right? So we can look at the end of Daniel chapter 11 and look at the symbolism in the verses there. And that would relate to the presidents of the United States or the kings of Persia at the beginning, right? Because you're going to have here mentioned Darius. It's in the time of Cyrus. There's going to be three more stand up. Cambyses, False Smyrtus, and Darius uh, the Persian, Darius the Great. And then you're going to have the fourth that she'll stand up in that count. And that's going to be Xerxes. So you can see that idea is already there. I don't know if we could go through and take each of the verses of Daniel 11 and particularly match them to each president of the United States. Um, but we could maybe take some of the notable presidents of the United States. Um, so, for instance, just as, as a trial here, um, who's the uh, Abraham Lincoln? Which number is he? 16? Dwight, are you there? So if we have the presidents of the United States... Just get a list here. And uh, so um, you know, so if we took somebody like Abraham Lincoln, he's the one during the Civil War, he's number 16. And if we, we went to verse 16, uh, he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, he shall stand in the glorious land which by his hand shall be consumed. Now, the question is, does that verse at all apply to Abraham Lincoln? Now, it is one that applies to the idea of, of who. We're going to know that that's going to be who in verse 16 that does according to his own will. You find that but from verse 15. The one that does according to his own will. Is it the king of the north or the king of the south? It's, it's, it's the king of the north, but I'm thinking, okay, maybe Lincoln, but he didn't consume the, the glorious land. He certainly stood up against it. I mean, against the king of the south. Okay, so this is going to be... Right? So this is Pinium. This is when the king of the south is defeated. Right? Because you're going to have, um, you know, because you have back in verse 11, you're going to have Raphia, right? King of the South shall be moved with color against him. And then in verse um, uh, 12, it says that he's going to be lifted up. You know, in the way that Jeff was looking at this, this was going to be dealing with uh, Russia and the United States, dealing with no November 9th originally. Then later on, he changed that. And then in verse 13, the king of the north shall return. And this is going to be all the battle of Raphia, right? And so in verse 16, this is the king of the north conquer conquering the king of the south. But in this case here, um, so this is the Seleucid Empire, right? So this is the king of the north. Um, but there's going to be, uh, and we haven't got there yet, but we, when we get there, I'll just show you here. Um, this is when Rome conquers Syria and Palestine. So what's going to happen here 
is that the king of the north, this is what I thought, is the king of the north is now going to become Rome. So this is entering in of Rome against, so the king of the north and the king of the south um, are in this battle, the battle of Paneum. But in the aftermath of that, we're going to see that Rome comes in. And, and Rome comes in early because Rome's going to come in later. Right. Um, so uh, so here's here's what Uriah Smith says. And so this is how we've always understood it. Um, Although Egypt had not been able to stand before Antiochus Magnus, the king of the north, Antiochus Asiaticus could not stand before the Romans who came against him. No kingdoms could resist this rising power. Syria was conquered and added to the Roman Empire when Pompey in 65 BC deprived Antiochus Asiaticus of his possessions and reduced Syria to a Roman province. The same power also was to stand in the Holy Land and consume it. The Romans became connected with the people of God, the Jews, by the alliance in 161 BC, which we know is 158 BC, as far as when it actually comes into effect. From this date, Rome held a prominent place in the prophetic calendar. It did not, however, acquire jurisdiction over Judea by actual conquest until 63 BC. On Pompey's return from his expedition against Mithridates, Eupater, king of Pontus, two competitors, son of the high priest of the Jews of Palestine, Mechanus and Aristobulus, were struggling for the crown of Judea. Their case came before Pompey, who soon perceived the injustice of the claims of Aristobulus, but he wished to defer a decision on the, in the matter until after his long-desired expedition unto, into Arabia, right? So anyway, this is going to show that that power here that does according to his own will is the paper, is Rome, right? It's not the papacy, but it's a characteristic of the papacy that we're going to see later in uh, Daniel um, 11, verse 36, right? The king shall do according to his will. That's going to be the pope, the papacy. So, so this doing according to his will is, is that characteristic. Um, now, the question is, can we match this up with Abraham Lincoln, right? That, that's the question. Um, could we take verse 16 as being Abraham Lincoln, verse 17 as, as the president who follows after, etc.? And I don't think we can do that. At least I don't see how we can. But we, we can do this in certain instances. So... I mean, maybe there is some way in which we could parallel with Rome conquering uh, the north and the south. Um, Maybe we could have this somehow connected with what happens in the Civil War um, with with the change in the United States that happens after the Civil War. Maybe, you know. Um, But that that's. You know, then if, you know, if we're going to say that, well, can we go to verse 36 and say, well, this is the 36th president of the United States? Um, Because that's an important verse that has this characteristic. And if we go to the 36th president, that's going to be Lyndon B. Johnson, right? So, you know, would we just, we, we, we do that? Would we say that that makes sense? I don't know, right? But but it is an, an interesting idea because we already have the idea. Is that helpful, Angela? Yes, it is. Okay. No. Well, well, the main point that I think that that we do as we look through this is that we we recognize that each of these kingdoms is a line. It typifies something. Now. We know that Persia typifies the United States in the history in which we are in. And we should be able to see then that what happens with these divisions of Greece typify the history that we are in as well in connection with with this struggle between the king of the north and the king of the south. So in the king of the north here, now there's different ways that we could look at it. 
Because even when we looked at verse 16, and we said, well, if this is presidents of the United States, and we looked at Lincoln, well, it's going to be during a time of the Civil War. And we have the North and the South. Well, we know we have the North and the South in ancient Israel. First, they're going to divide into North and South during the American Revolutionary War in 977 BC, right? Right, you can see the parallel there, right? So you're gonna have that division of North and South. And so, you know, you can say that the God's people are divided North and South in that history. Um, so you have a North and a South, right? But you also have the history of the Civil War in 742 BC, which parallels not the Revolutionary War, you know, in in you know in the 17 uh, 76 in that area, but it symbolizes uh, the Civil War in 1863. So you can look at when the kingdom is divided. That's going to represent uh, a parallel to when America forms, and then the Civil War in 742 is going to be more parallel to the Civil War in the United States the 1860s. So so we have these Norths and Souths. And so we have this in Greece as well. Now, we have Greece here, literally the North and the South are, are actual places. And, you know, that those are their locations. They're North and South of each other. We don't necessarily have to, that to be the case when we're dealing at the end of the world because it's just the characteristics, right? So we know that uh, the King of the South in 1989 is way in the North, right? That's going to be the Soviet Union, the USSR. So um, it's not really about location and it's not about territory that they control, which is how Uriah Smith tries to address it. But the point is, just in the simplest form, is each of these histories should parallel the history in our time. So we shouldn't have to match like every single verse because we're not we're not going through American history from the beginning up into our, our time. We're going from 1989 to the second coming or the Sunday law at least in understanding these lines, right? So there might be parallels, you know, to some of the presidents earlier, but it's really the presidents from Reagan to who's ever going to be the seventh president uh, that we're, we're, we're following. But it's different aspects of uh, or different powers in that history that are being examined. So when we look at the Persian kings, they're going to be typifying the presidents of the United States. But we wouldn't expect that that's the case with Greece. Right. So when we have Alexander's kingdom and it's going to be broken. Wouldn't we sort of more likely try to equate that with the fall of the Soviet Union itself? It's just just the question. I'm not saying that that's that's how we should do it. But but this is about Greece. This is the globalist. This is the world. And we know that that aspect that Greece represents is best represented by communism. Now, we think of communism as just, well, that's Russia. But communism is Russia and China and all these other different countries that um, have an idea about um, history and politics and what direction we are to go as far as forming governments. And it is, it's globalist in its approach, right? It's, it's not really a nationalist movement. It's a globalist movement. So globalism sees nationalism as a bad thing, right? Get rid of nations. It's, we just need a one world government. We need, we need everybody on the planet all on the same page, working towards the same goals, the same ends. If you're working towards your individual ends, those individual ends um, 
conflict with the needs of society as a whole, right? Where in the capitalist idea, we understand that when people uh, work on their individual needs, everyone benefits. Right? If, you, if you're trying to work for what you call the good of everyone, um, and you're supposed to be acting in the good of others, um, in, in the sense like economically, trying to be considered to be, I uh, can't remember the word that they use, the World Economic Forum uses. Um, but um, it has to do with a, a type of capitalism. Uh, what is it called? Can't think of it. But anyway, it's, it's where you're, um, oh man, I wish I could think of the word because it's the best word to express it. Um, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Anyway, it's where we're thinking about not what's best for a particular business, but what's best for, you know, the world. Because, But we can't know what's best for everyone else. That's part of the problem. Because when you have people try to decide what's best for everyone, we end up what's best really only for those in power, right? The individual gets trampled. The larger you make that group, uh, the more that the individual themselves is, is harmed, right? So that's, that's a basic principle that we would understand. So, so when we're looking at this king that stands up, it's, it's Alexander the Great, right? He is not a president of the United States, right? This is a globalism and globalism in 1989 would be characterized by the USSR. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, so we can look at some of these people's names as Angela's doing here. So we're gonna have Seleucus, the first Nicator, meaning songbird, when there is anything to do with tire singing like a harlot is King of the North representing the future papacy. And that's kind of an interesting idea. Um, so it might, might be true. Singing like a harlot, he's a songbird. So that's going to be the, the King of the North. That's the first King of the North. But let's not go there yet. So let's go to Alexander. So this is the fall of Alexander's empire, right? That's what's going to... So we're just mentioning, here's this mighty king. He stands up. He shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Um, but if we're going to apply this to Greece at the end of the world, and we're going to place it in 1989, would this best symbolize the Soviet Union? That's just a question. It may. Okay, so it may, right? Because if we're going to put this on a line, because we've already put the kings of Persia on a line, so, so we know how that line works, um, the, how it fits into our history. So, so if we're going to say that Alexander's, the fall of his kingdom represents or typifies the fall of the Soviet Union, then um, it, we, we could follow through and figure out how this, this would apply. But what's going to end up is two powers, the king of the north and the king of the south. Now, it's going to be the king of the south that represents um, you know, the, the, the aspect of communism. The king of the north here is going to be a different sort of power. That's going to be Ultimately, Rome is going to become the king of the north. But here under Greece, um, we have these two powers, the king of the north and the king of the south, these two divisions of the empire. Those are what's going to be focused upon. The kingdom is divided towards the four winds of heaven, um, but it's going to be the king of the north and the king of the south that are, are mentioned. So the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him, 
and have dominion, and his dominion shall be a great dominion. And at the end of the years, they shall join themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall she stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. So this is going to be about Bernice, right? So when we uh, we look here, and we're just going to go to Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith. Um, so he's just going to say, this, this is the, the portions of the four winds of heaven, north, south, east, etc., or west, I guess that should be, there should be a W there. These divisions may well be reckoned from Palestine, the central part of the empire, etc. Um, then it says uh, the successors of Cassandra were very were soon very soon conquered by Lysimachus and his kingdom. Greece and Macedon was annexed to Thrace. Lysimachus was in turn conquered by Seleucus. The Macedon and Thrace were annexed to Syria. These facts prepare the way for an application of the text before us. The king of the south, Egypt, shall be strong. Ptolemy, so they're named Cyprus, or annex Cy Cyprus, Phoenicia, Caria, right, all these different kingdoms. So we know it's just divided north and south. And then this part here. Um, so they're going to be at the end of years, shall they join? Now, um, so the end of years. So what is this? Why is this term being used here? Not Shana, right? So like Rosh Hashanah, Shana or Hashana, and the end of years, that's eights, that's just the border, right? Um, so, so there's usually like a border of years. So what years, what border is being marked here? Why, why is this end of years being marked? They just shall join themselves together. So I've never really dealt with this idea before, but what is this end of years? Not what is it in this history, what is it in our history? So they shall join themselves together for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north and make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up. And they that brought her, and he, he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. So can we place this anywhere in our history? Because this is a, a, a an attempted league between the king of the north and the king of the south with a woman involved. Woman represents a church. Is there anything we can do with this? Could it be the Pope, the UN, and, and the US make, making the Sunday law or enforcing the Sunday law? Okay, so... So it seems like some kind of league like that, something to do with a Sunday law. So we're going to say the king of the south are the globalists. Uh, the king of the north, in this case, would be the United States. And the woman would be the Berenice. She would be the papacy. Is that what you're saying? Is that how you would look at these symbols? Well, that's what I'm thinking it could mean. In the end of years, I'm thinking, well, the last days. Yeah, okay. So the last days, but this must be an end of some kind of time prophecy. So just to say, you know, April 5th, 2030, I don't know. I'm, just, I'm, I'm sort of being half serious only, um, but partially serious, is that there is some point of time whether we know what it is or not, that that must be marked.
right? So we, we, we can see the, the parallels here to some degree what's happening in Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, right? There are some things that are similar. Uh, but the question that we have when we look at Daniel 11 and we try to apply it to our history is uh, that it's it's applied in a sort of a fractured way. That is, you have a verse that applies and you can parallel, parallel it, but it's not following chronologically right through. That is, you can't just go back to Greece and just say, well, all of this is just until the end of Greece, till we get Rome in verse 16. Um, um, you know, when you get to verse 16, you can't all of a sudden say, well, all of this history is just the progression of the history from 1989 to the Sunday law, right? It, it keeps repeating this history. It is this battle between the North and the South. And it's showing different um, different pictures of that history, different details occurring in our time, in our history. So we have to have some way that we can line this up. There, there must be some key that we're missing to know exactly where to place these parallels. Since they're, they're presented in a kind of fractured way, you know, repetitiously, giving us more detail each time, a repeat and enlarge of, of our history. How do we sort through this? So we can see these parallels. We can see there are things there. You know, definitely a league between the king of the south and the king of the north. This seems like something, especially with a woman involved, like the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Because this is not this is what we have not really done in our studies of Daniel chapter eleven. Like we know the history of Daniel eleven, how it's fulfilled, but placing that in our history, there's been different theories on how to do that. Any ideas on what we can do? Okay, so if we talk about the end of years, can we can we place this somewhere? Because we can say it's the time of the end, right? Maybe. Okay. Any ideas what we can do with this?
Nobody has any ideas? I, I don't know what to do with it. But I think it's significant. Now, what about the verse number itself, 11.6? Does that give us any indication? What have we done with 11.6 in the book of Judges? What if we turn it upside down? What's 11.6 upside down? There's different ways we could turn it upside down. But let's say we just... Nine we just eleven. Okay, it's 9.11, isn't it? So is there a league that's made um, at September 11th? Is there some kind of league made? And is there a church involved? So could we place this at 9-11? Can this be, have anything to do with spiritual formation? Why wouldn't it have uh, I think so. <laughs> okay. If the apostate daughters of Babylon come to the Pope and say, yeah, we're going to swear to you, but later on we're going to destroy you. I mean, I can see all that in there. Okay. So, so can we say that Berenice represents uh, the Adventist church in this case? That would be an intriguing application. Okay. Uh, now, the name Berenice means bringer of victory, so I'm not sure um, with that particularly how you would uh, – um, uh, it's from the Attic Greek, Fereniki, uh, which means bear of victory from ancient Greek, Pharaoh to bear – and Niki victory. So the bearer of victory. So that's what Berenice means. Um, and could that symbolize in some way uh, the Adventist church? But there's this compromise. So we're going to have a compromise here. The Adventist church being in the United States, the king of the north, right? Um but in this case, Berenice is so you know we're just we're just exploring these ideas. Berenice is um, she's from the south, and she'll come to the king of the north. So so it's kind of difficult unless we look at this uh, this king's daughter as you know in the south. So which you know. The church shouldn't be. So I don't know how we would address that. Or it's just it's describing that aspect of the church that's connected to spiritualism. It could be the Protestants. But it's coming from it's the daughter of the South. This new age idea. Now, of course, that does come with it, into Christianity in that history preceding 9-11. Right. And, and, and Jeff had been studying that all through the 90s. Uh, what had happened with Protestantism? Protestantism had basically been given over to spiritualism. Right. All these sort of spiritual manifestations um, and false ideas. So so maybe that has something. So maybe the daughter here is just simply the daughter of the king of the south being spiritualism but coming to the king of the north. So the king of the north here, we would normally think of, if we're going to relate it to these churches, um, spiritualistic, it would be a Protestant power, which is the one that is combining with the papacy. 
How's that idea sound? Like we're just throwing ideas out there. So, so we have this 9-11 symbol here, 11-6. We can say it's 9-11. Okay. Did we determine <clears throat> what his arm is representing? Um, hmm. Well, I don't know. Uh, in 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 what context? Like in this verse itself, or just in other places? Well, I mean, I mean, we it have to the military power. All Let right. Go on. No, I'm just I'm asking the question because we have different symbols being passed in this in this portion i mean as the as the verse reads and in the end of years they shall join themselves together the alternative hebrew would be and at the end of years they shall associate themselves so right. This this would give a a positive support to the idea that this is taking place after 1989. Yeah. Okay. Now, so the other thing is, I just looked at the word years. Okay. So the, word, the word years, the Hebrew number is eight one four one. If we count from September 11th. You know, the days as days. So the September 11th being the first day. Um, it's 8,141 inclusive days. To um, December 25th, 2023. So that's the date that's uh, coming up. So, we, well, we just have the symbol of December 25th there which we had in 2001, we had in 20, uh, 2022, and now we have it marked here in 2023. If that's, if I'm just using that symbol, counting from September 11th. Okay. Um, so I know I get sometimes get caught up with these numerical symbols, but they do help us. Right. See some things. Um now, if I count, uh, because it talks about the end, um, I could uh, go back here, just hang on. If I count, uh, the, the word N7093, and I just do a cardinal count from September 11th, which I find interesting because it's going to give us February 11th, 2021. Now, Stephen's not here, but we know that's his birthday and that Stephen has an interesting characteristic, that he's, he's born 11,900 days or 32 years and seven months to the day before September 11th. 2001 and if we count um then this uh from september 11th 2001 we count this word n7093 it brings us again to stephen's birthday in 2021 so february 11th so so it ties together these two things these ends of years it ties us to the symbol of December 25th, and it ties us to the symbol of Stephen's birthday, this 211. So, so it shows that 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 those are connected. Well, that's all. 
shows that, that these this chronology connected with 2001 which is is what this is about that we can connect it there that's that's all it's showing us you know it's not saying anything special about Stephen other than he's part of studying these these lines or these prophecies so so if we can have those two symbols together so we have September 11th February 11th and December 25th all tied together in this end of years it can help us point again to 911 right because Stephen's birthday points to 911 being 11,900 days he's born before 911 okay does that make sense that that adds a level to this okay now yes it, it adds a level to make that this 116 verse is is bringing us to 911 and and that would add to the idea that this is the fall of the soviet union in 1989 that's mentioned in connection with the fall of alexander's kingdom and then we're brought to 911 with this story of berenice okay go on all right as the verse continued for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north and make an agreement but the alternate reading would be for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make rights. Okay. What if this what if this situation with the daughter of the south is another manner of saying this introduction of the small people, these diverse groups that want their rights. And that the king of the north then chooses to give them rights which don't belong to them. Oh man, we can sure see that. I mean, we we have the example of different Roman rulers, whether you're dealing with Caligula, Nero, whatever, one of whom chose to marry his horse. And we've got all these these other rights that are being granted that have nothing to do with anything that, that was being shown in the Bible. Yeah, I don't know if I would take the word there to mean that, because what you're doing is just taking two different definitions of the word right. Um, right. So, no, no pun intended there. Um, because this this Hebrew word, um, I mean, probably the best way to translate it is as the word agreement. Um, but it, it literally, may shar means evenness. Uh, that is prosperity or concord or straightness. So this doesn't have to do with anything with, with human rights. So when it talks about equal or equity or right in the definition, it's, it's about making things even. So, I mean... I mean, if you're going to try to connect it to human rights, um, that would be, uh, you know, difficult to do. I mean, it's possible. But also here it's a noun. Right? I don't so, think it started um, off. Equality, right. equity, they're always talking about this stuff. Right. When you're using it as an adverb, but here this is a noun, right? Because they're making an agreement. So, So as a noun... Um, I, I don't think you could you could equate it with human rights, but that's just my my opinion, because um, I don't think that that's what this is talking about. It's 
the, the idea is that there is a concord. This is a league being made between the king of the north and the king of the south. So they're not trying to make anything about human rights. It's not about rights. It's about, um, it's about a league. It's about a concord. Right? So. But at this point, have we not seen a league being developed within the laws of the United States and, in fact, in many churches? And I, ha I have to include the Adventist Church in this as a point that we are not going to <clears throat> go against the supposed rights of so many of these small groups. Yeah, I understand that that's happening. But so I'm not disagreeing. I'm just saying that here, the focus is upon the league. Right. Right, the agreement, right? So if you try to say, take, take it to apply to human rights, it just takes away from the whole point of the sentence that you basically have a concord, an agreement made between these two parties. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, all those things are true, like human rights and all that stuff is going on. And, and that's going to be partly connected because of, of spiritualism, right? The king of the south. Right. But but here, if we're going to take this as 9-11, we're trying to apply it to spiritual formation in the Adventist church. So now we know that it's, of course, it's not just the Adventist church that's getting spiritual formation all of these protestant churches are supporting it the reason why the church makes this agreement is because they want their uh theological institutions uh to be accredited and in and they want them to be accredited by protestant institutions right correct so in order to to get, to maintain that accreditation this becomes a requirement So, so that's one of the points that I think that we would have there, that this just is, that's the purpose of this um, uh, agreement. Yeah, so there you have the merger of Greece and Rome. Greece and Rome. Yeah, well, I understand what you're saying, but here in the context, we're trying to put this at 9-11, right? So at 9-11, we have a spiritual power, which is described as the king of the south. This is atheism, right? Secularism, spiritualism. And then we have the king of the north. The king of the north in this history would represent the United States in connection with the papacy, because the United States is... Uh, the power of the king of the north. It's the military power of the king of the north. It's it's the false prophet as well. But in the context of north and south, we place the United States as the king of the north because it's involved in the fall of the Soviet Union, right? So so the king of the south has to refer to that atheistic, spiritualistic, communistic, however one you what it kind of istic you want it to be. It's got to be that. Kind of istic, right? And and that's represented by spiritual formation for the Adventist Church. And it's going to be this daughter of the King of the South, and that would be a church. And so there is a church involved in that it's the Protestant churches. But but they're now the daughter of the South, not the daughter of the papacy. Right, even though they are children of the papacy. It's that aspect, that spiritualistic aspect that is from the South that we would, because we call spiritual formation spiritualism, right? Which is a which is part of the dragon power. In the past, <laughs> have we not looked at the king of the south as being more of a 
spiritualistic representation. Yeah, yeah, and that's so. So that's why we would say this must be spiritual formation at nine eleven. Because I can't think of any other league that we could put at 9-11 that would be represented by this story, if this is representing 9-11. I can see where we're replacing this to begin at 9-11. Yeah. I guess I'm asking, is it possible that this verse is showing us a progression from 9-11 to where we're at now. Well, it's definitely... I think it goes now. even... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would agree. That's that's what it's doing. Okay, what are you saying, Angela? I said, I think that it goes beyond that because it says, uh, uh, she shall be given up. Okay, that's the end of her, the spiritualism. And they that brought her and he that began her. So the papacy, the U.S., they're all going to be d- destroyed at the very end of time. He that strengthened mm-hmm. her in these times. The ones that support her are going to destroy her. Yeah, so it's, it's always pointing to the end of, of these lines, right? Well, we recognize from other sources that there's a threefold unit. And we've always taken that threefold unit union as being the papacy plus spiritualism plus this with the United States. Yeah. Because what do we have when the hand is reached across the gulf? A league. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm looking at this that the king of the south as the remnant of paganism is bringing in this spiritualistic aspect yeah right so like we're going to draw this on the line tomorrow right uh, get these few verses so i'm saying that what we have from verse three is we have a depiction of the soviet union like in our history right that's going to be this mighty king that she'll stand up and she'll do according to his will so even though this this symbolism is attached to the papacy. We can see how um, in the parallel of this, in this time of the end, um, because we know in 1798 we have a time of the end, the power that's going to be taken down is the papacy, right? But in 1989, the papacy is responding to what happened in 1798, Right? So it's it's not the papacy in 1989 that's being taken down. And so we're saying that there's a characteristic here that the Soviet Union has that is a characteristic of the papacy itself. And it's going to fall, right? So when he shall stand up, the Soviet Union has stood up. His kingdom's going to be broken. That's going to be 1989. It's divided towards the four winds of heaven. But in the end, it ends up as two kingdoms. We now have the king of the south, which is this spiritualistic aspect, which isn't the Soviet Union anymore, right? That that characteristic of atheism and um, and licentiousness passes to another power. And so the king of the south shall be strong. Even though the Soviet Union fell, the king of the south still exists. Right. So he's still going to have a dominion. Right. And that's going to be the U.N., the globalists that come out of what happened in 1989. So that fracturing of the Soviet Union creates this strength of this southern kingdom. Then Daniel 11, verse 
6 is going to represent September 11th. And this is going to show this power, this spiritualistic power, this agreement that, that occurs. So, so it's showing our history, at least the way that I see it. And it's marking out these way marks, but it's looking at it from a different aspect. It's looking at it from this religious aspect. Not so much from the political aspect, even though it talks about the power of his arm in the, in the history there. Here, it's going to be talking about what's happening within the churches themselves, within the Adventist church. And then when we get to verse 7, which we haven't got to, but out of the branch of her roots. So this is Berenice's roots historically, but this would be this daughter of the king of the south of spiritualism shall one stand up in his estate um, which shall come with an army and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north and shall deal against them and shall prevail so so we have to figure out how are we going to apply this next verse if this if we've applied this correctly are we going to go back and show some other illustration of this history? Or is this something continuing? The other thing just to point out, like even in verse four, it's going to bring us to the end when, when Greece is conquered by the papacy, by Rome, right? In this context, by Rome, in our context, by the papacy, where the globalists are content. Um, um, and then you're going to see the same thing with, with Berenice. It's going to bring us to the end. So it keeps pointing to the end of these things. And the question is whether we, we're just having these fractured snapshots of our lines or do we put them together to make a whole line? So when we get to verse seven out of the branch of her roots, well, so we have a branch of her roots. Um, um, you know, what, what is this referring to? Shall one stand up in his estate? Um, so, so there's, you know, there's symbols that we need to look at. The symbols are going to help us in these, uh, names, numbers, um, and I'm just looking here. Yeah, I'm going to have to look at some of these things uh, in more detail. Okay. Any, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? So we're just kind of starting on this, this course. We're going to see if it makes sense. You know, we might find that it doesn't really make any sense what we're trying to do here. But um, that's, that's what we're going to, going to try to do. We're going to try to put this on a line, see if we can make sense out of it. If not, then we just abandon this, this line of uh, investigation. Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here this morning. We pray that you can be with each person and help them in the things they have to do. May your angels watch over us. May you guide and direct us. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.